zooming out. Look, there's a whole globe there. That's how far we're going to zoom out. I thought we needed to zoom out before we get into the new book that we're reading. I wanted to go back to our textbook from a long time ago. And one version of this class, I was going to put this book explicitly right against our textbook just to compare and contrast where we were. And then we were going to finish out with anthropological optimism. But I changed it up so we did anthropological optimism in the middle, which might have been a good idea. But I want to revisit some themes from human adaptive strategies to show us where we are. So if we go back way out, zooming into the big picture here, we saw already how human beings, people go all over the world. And the way that they did that was by hunting and gathering. And it wasn't just one pattern, it was doing different things in different climates. Some people ate more meat, some people ate more plants, depending where you were and how your social structure was. And this included some places that were pretty extreme. I mean, you wouldn't even imagine that people could live there and they were able to make hunting and gathering work, adapting to their environment in basically a cultural way or using learned behavior. And in fact, some people have said that the human beings made places habitable, which weren't really very nice to live in before. So the Amazon, for example, is a place that probably benefited from humans doing things that in, in that environment which we don't even really understand today because we spent a lot of time trying to eliminate indigenous peoples from these environments. But it's become more clear, as I read about in that chapter in Anthropological Optimism about indigenous land care practices, that these techniques have made these ecosystems more resilient. Now, there are some people who get down on humans because it does seem that in some instances, there were these big animals, the megafauna around when humans came into various continents and then they go away. Now, some people say that the humans hunted down these big sloths and things, and that's why they went away. Other people say it may have been just climate change in general. However, if we really look around at things, there are certainly some times where human beings messed some stuff up and modified the environment in ways that were probably not the best. But as of, say, 500 years ago or so, we might generally describe what humans done as an incredible achievement, or as our title of our textbook is, Human Adaptive Strategies which is basically to say that if we looked around the world, we'd see people living in different ways, but generally in sustainable ways. And as they put it, even in sustainable population ways. So the population, for example, of the world was relatively stable up until about 200 years ago. So there isn't a big boom, everything's fine. Now I say all this to beware a couple of people who are down on human beings. They think human beings in general as a species suck. And remember that video I showed you, uh, Agent Smith from the Matrix claiming that humans are a virus which just reproduces and grows and then takes up all the resources and environment. That's not true. Human beings may have had something to do with the disappearance of the megafauna, but in general, they did not cause environmental crises in the, all the places that they went to. And we also don't see environmental crises always arising from agriculture. We certainly see places where things get a little bit overextended or there are temporary or local fails, you might say. But the idea that agriculture caused all these environmental crises is simply mistaken. So what is the issue that leads us to today's world, or how did we get to here? And in our anthropological optimism chapter, they did talk about this idea of the Anthropocene, that we live now in a time where human beings are more influential than any other factors in the environment. 
and people have debated about when that happened. Some people want to take it back to agriculture. Some people want to take it to the Industrial Revolution. Some people will say it's the Atomic Age, about from the 1950s on. I am fairly convinced that the Anthropocene begins, or we can see the evidence of it, as a result of the colonial enterprise of Europe colonizing the Americas and then importing enslaved Africans, depopulating Africa in order to repopulate and a, a depopulated Americas. And so you can actually see this in the geological record. And so some people have said, well, this is the first instance where you can see a global influence of human beings. Whether or not we want to call this the Anthropocene, or as our authors in the Anthropological Optimism chapter called it the colonial scene, that is to say a time when in indigenous peoples experienced the apocalypse, they already experienced it before. It's not new for many indigenous peoples. That is when we would locate it. So if whether we want to call this epic the Anthropocene or the colonial scene, it's not that important. What is important is that during this time, say around the year 1500 through 1600, what we might call the heyday of the colonial period, we saw a tremendous displacement from uh, various ways, often through disease and forced labor of the people who inhabited the Americas. We see at this time the emergence of extractive mining on an industrial scale in order to give us the world's silver and gold supply. It's, it was a pretty brutal enterprise, generally coming out of what is now Bolivia, and what is now some of the mines in Mexico. We see this happening in the Americas and costing lots of indigenous people's lives, as well as the lives of Africans who became involved in the enslavement trade. Now, most of the Africans were brought into the Americas in order to produce sugar on plantations. And we see here again the first industrial scale farming in the form of the sugar plantation and other plantations that were then going into the Americas. Now, Hernandez says something interesting about the relationship between indigenous peoples and Black people in the Americas. So here we have settler colonialism, and everyone must understand whether their positionality on indigenous lands which we are all on, here we are, is that of a settler, yes, that's me, an unwelcome guest. So she talks about how when she moves from different places, even if you are considered indigenous in one place, you might be an unwelcome guest when you move to another place or a welcomed guest. And I want to point out on this page that she says that settlers are those who are not indigenous to the continents of the Americas. And to me, settlers do not include black folks who were forcefully taken from their ancestral homeland during slavery. To me, black people are included in the indigeneity discourse and the indigenous scholarship I write about. And so I just point this out because it's not always the case that someone who is Participating in the indigeneity discourse takes this approach. What she's saying is that this creates new forms of indigeneity, even though people are displaced from their original homelands. So this is how we have settler colonialism developing for the first time, at least in the Americas. And then after that, what is known as the Industrial Revolution and everybody knows about that, and everybody gets excited about it. But it's really built on the resources that were extracted from and developed in the Americas. First with the silver and gold, revving up the world's trade systems, and then with sugar, cotton. Those resources were fed into, in some cases quite literally fed, into the workers who would create the Industrial Revolution. During this time, we developed our belief that science, industry, would bring development to not just 
the industrialized countries, but that everybody would start to follow this model of the Industrial Revolution. And whatever position you were in, if you were an anthropologist or even probably many indigenous people believed that the indigenous peoples were themselves, had already disappeared or were about to disappear, and certainly that their way of life was going to disappear as well. And so a lot of anthropologists went out to try and what was called salvage anthropology or salvage ethnography. You'd try to collect various things from knowledge to actual stuff because it was based on the idea that it was about to go away because everyone was going to develop into this Western or industrial way of life. No. I mean, the industrial world and industrial farming had a lot of benefits. We're all benefiting from it. Now, the fact that I can be here, show you all these things as a result of what happened back then. So I'm not going to pretend that this hasn't been the basis of our lifestyle and our lives. However, we are probably at the point where we are able to acknowledge that it's led us to the doorstep of the actually existing environmental crisis. Now, I want to point out here that there has been a long-standing indigenous criticism of this idea of development, modernization, industrialization. And so the people who now critique industrialization from, you might say, the, the European and US perspective were often inspired by, although that those links are sometimes buried by the criticism that the indigenous people had of what was going on. And it is certainly the case that when we think about things like deforestation, extractive mining, the poisoning of various environments, dumping stuff onto various people, it was first felt on the indigenous lands in these places where silver and gold were extracted and on the ruins of the plantation economy. Again, we talked about how in the chapter people say that indigenous peoples already experienced the apocalypse. The environmental issues that resulted from industrialization also became visible to more and more people in the United States and in European countries during the 1930s through the 1960s. And this happened as people were developing different forms of industrialism. We talked about the capitalist style farms in our textbook that grew enormously big and resulted in a very low percentage of people actually being involved in agriculture, but a very high productivity, but based on basically petrochemicals infusing the soil. This was also true in the socialist world. It wasn't like in, in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet countries, as well as China, there was this idea that we would have huge industrial collective farms. And in fact, many of the socialist ideas were based on the idea that they were going to do capitalism, but bigger and better even than the capitalists because they would plan it all out. And so the amount of pollution that was evident during this time, if you watch things that were happening in the 1960s when one of the Great Lakes caught on fire and people were just dumping trash by the side of the road, that's when Earth Day was established. That we were being warned about what would happen. Now, during the 1970s, and 1980s in that time, there were some successes in terms of, say, trash. People started doing things like bottle and can deposits. So people didn't just throw their cans and bottles out of the window and onto the side of the road. That's what it was like when I was a kid. You just drove along and threw your can out. Didn't care. Now people really don't do that. Every so often I have to pick up a can from my yard, but it's very rare. The ozone layer was said to be disintegrating, and but people were able to change that. People have been able to produce enough food in a way to survive. 
to basically compress things in landfills so they're not overflowing. And there are certain places in which population has actually is declining. Is there a place, there are countries that are scared that their population is going to decline by too much. Japan's population, for example, is predicted to go down to half of what it is today. Places in, in France and Italy, South Korea, are all trying to promote people having children because they're worried that their population is about to go under. However, despite those excesses, we continue to output various emissions, and there continue to be population growth in many other parts of the world, leading to what we see today, certainly saw last summer, all through this year, and maybe this summer too, knock on wood that we won't, as much these increases in extreme climate events. To the extent that Bates and company said in a quote that our food systems are due for a major shakeup not seen globally since the Neolithic 10,000 years ago, which is scary. It's a pretty big deal. So in response to this, we have read Bates and company, and I'll include here the traditional approaches of ecological anthropology, which we're studying now. But we're moving on to a new book by Jessica Hernandez, which brings us a fresh perspective on these issues or a different approach to this. So when we looked at Bates, and in general, when we look at an anthropology of other people, so anthropologists that go off and study among other people. What does Hernandez want to do in this book? What does she say we should have instead of books about indigenous people? Books by indigenous people. Books by indigenous people. Yeah. So she wants to move to from books about to books by. In Bates, and in many places, we ask you to do all kinds of citations to the literature. What does Hernandez draw upon? What gives her authority to write? My experiences? Her experiences. <laughs> yeah, she's saying, I'm going to cite the experience that I've had myself. And if you look at your typical textbook, I was actually looking for a picture of Daniel Bates and I couldn't find one because you're, you're supposed to have this unbiased outside the world perspective. Whereas in Hernandez, we hear a lot about her family. We even have a young picture, like a baby picture almost. What we learned in El Salvador, which had one of the most brutal wars in the Americas and displaced many indigenous people and so became a migrant through Mexico, where he met her mother, who is considers herself in, an indigenous person in Mexico, but then she herself becomes an immigrant into the United States. Now, in general... The books like Bates's book and others are aimed at people who are making policy or aimed at academics. In comparison or in contrast, or Hernandez says that these need to be aimed toward community needs. So in general, what Bates and others, they sometimes praise what, what is called traditional ecological knowledge. But Hernandez wants to move us toward she calls indigenous science, a different way of doing science, which harnesses, so it puts it, real knowledge for the community. I talked about how much of anthropology was based on this idea of salvaging or rescuing knowledge that was about to disappear because people believed that indigenous peoples themselves and the indigenous way of life was about to disappear. And for Hernandez, it's like, wait a second. We are still here, and in fact, we are thriving. We saw this back in the Anthropological Optimism book as well. In traditional academic study like we're doing in this class, we are organizing ourselves into disciplines, and you study anthropology, or you study biology, or you study ecology. What does she want to do with that whole idea of separate disciplines? 
studying separate things. Yeah, Combine different subjects. So she's looking at how she's going to be using this word. You can combine holistically different things together. And later on, she'll talk about how it's not just interdisciplinary, but looking for the interconnections among all spheres of life. Bates and all, and in general, anthropologists tend to get into the idea of environmentalism as a movement, whereas Hernandez is going to tell us that often Western-style environmentalism and Western-style conservation ignored indigenous peoples and didn't didn't take their perspectives into account. So if you look at a picture of her today, this was in the Audubon magazine, Jessica Hernandez on why Western environmentalism won't save us, the need for a new perspective. Now, if you Google Jessica Hernandez, you'll come up with Jessica Hernandez, the author of our book, but you might also run across Jessica Hernandez, the rock singer, or Jessica Hernandez and the Deltas out of Detroit, Michigan. Now, if we were to just guess, based on this name and this person, what would we call the person? Well, what might we think that her identity is? Jessica Hernandez. Latina, thank you. Yes, exactly. In fact, that would be basically correct for Jessica Hernandez and the Deltas because her mother is from Mexico. So yeah, she, I don't know what she sees herself as, but she sees herself as Latina. So we might say that she is Latina. So it used to be people talked about Latinos because in Spanish, when you say Latinos, that encompasses in that gender formation is supposed to encompass everybody in the gendered alignment of the Spanish language. But it's like saying man when you mean human beings. So some people have talked about putting a little back up, a little slash in there to talk about Latino or Latinas. But then people are like, well, yeah, but that doesn't encompass the possibility of trans identity. So then for a while, people are like, yeah, we'll talk about Latin X. But there's a little problem with Latin X is it's almost impossible to pronounce in Spanish because you would never have a construction like that. So some people today feel the cover term should be Latine with an E, which is pronounceable in Spanish and does make sense while being not so gendered. Spanish has been a very gendered language. Now, in the United States, this is a label, whatever you're going to say, which encompasses many different populations. And many of the people who are labeled as Latinos don't necessarily consider themselves to be that. They would more consider themselves to be associated with their place of origin. The three largest groups in the United States have origins in either Cuba. I just want to talk for a minute about how different these perspectives are. So a lot of the people who have origins in Cuba typically have lived in Florida, typically left Cuba just around or before the revolution. So are very against socialist Cuba and against Fidel Castro have tended to vote very Republican over time, very different from other populations. The other populations might have origins in Puerto Rico. Anyone in Puerto Rico is a U.S. citizen, but it cannot vote in presidential elections and doesn't have representation in Congress either. It makes no sense, yes. There's a few places like that. Guam, also another place. Well, there's a territory, American Samoa, places that people don't even know about. But Puerto Rico is perhaps more obvious because there, here we are. And then the third, again, these are just the largest groups in the United States. The third group has origins in Mexico. Some people were living in what is now the United States, like an example in a state in New Mexico from before it was even the United States. As some people put it, they didn't cross the border, the border crossed them. So all of a sudden they're living in the United States when they thought they were living in Mexico. 
Mexico is also famous for promoting what is called a mestizo national identity. And the idea of mestizo, technically it means mixed. The idea is that we are all mixed in Mexico. We are mestizos. And some people on the census will mark that down as their race because the idea is there is a mix of Spanish and indigenous people and that the Mexican nation is a result of that mix and the people are all mixed up or mestizos as a new and improved race. Now, the Jessica Hernandez we are reading, though, does not identify as that. She identifies as indigenous. And so she is saying that she is not mestiza, because mestiza is the mixture of Spanish and indigenous. And she says, no, I'm indigenous. I am not participating in this mestizo thing. And she also says that she is not Latina. That Latina is a word that people use to describe basically in the United States. And so she doesn't identify as that either. So as we talked about, her father came from El Salvador, but an indigenous community there and her mother from Mexico, but an indigenous community is there. And what she is saying is that those classed as Mexican in the United States in their own country might be, or she might consider them to be the settler colonialists. So that is to say that from her perspective, many of the people who have come to the United States and are classed as Latinos or, in, or even we in the United States say, oh, they're indigenous people are not actually indigenous, that they are basically the original settler colonialists and that in their own country, they would be maybe seen as maybe not Spanish, but as whites, blancos, or as mestizos. And so they are not actually in some... She is saying that the, many of the immigrants and migrants and people in the United States are do not identify as indigenous and would not identify as indígena in their own place. She talks about the domino effect of xenophobia. So xenophobia, we usually associate with the United States. And in this book, she's talking about how this also happens in Mexico, and it's xenophobia against, say, Guatemalans or El Salvadorans or indigenous people there. But I'm glad you did bring up Europe because, yeah, it's in some ways perhaps even more of a huge issue there. In fact, I was just listening on the radio coming in that the British prime minister and the parliament have just approved an idea that they're going to send refugee seekers to Rwanda. So they're just going to put these people on planes and fly them to Rwanda and you'll do your refugee seeking there. And whether this will actually happen is still un for debate because apparently they can't find an airplane company who will support them.